So, uh, welcome everyone again. Uh, this is the second uh, panel of the conference and our main theme is uh, gender history. Uh, let me introduce uh, very briefly the three panelists. Uh, two of them are sitting uh, here at the table. Uh, Susan Zimmermann uh, from uh, CEU Vienna and Dora uh, Zeferner Fedeles from Institute of History uh, Budapest. And uh, the third participant is uh, Zsófia Lorand uh, 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 from uh, University of Vienna, who joined us uh, via Zoom. Uh, I'm not introduce uh, the research field of each participant, because um, I hope they will present it themselves in the first uh, part of the panel. So, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to ask you um, to talk about uh, gender history and its relation uh, to the main uh, theme of this conference, the Central and Eastern European Historical narratives through the examples of your own research field and your uh, own experiences. So, um, Jofia, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much and hello everyone. I'm, I'm glad to see you on Zoom and I'm very sorry I can't be there. Hopefully this though spares you some nasty fall daycare viruses that I would be just spreading. And um, that being said, I'm going to talk a little bit about feminist um, and gender intellectual history and the role of gender in intellectual history with regard to East Central Europe as a narrower field. Uh, but I will start with um, a broader introduction um, about um, this field and why I think it's relevant. Uh, the reason why, although as I will show you, it's not an easy task to do intellectual history of women and feminism in East Central Europe specifically, the method itself is extremely helpful in terms of its focus of uh, focusing on texts, but understanding them in their context um, and through this kind of analysis, it also opens up to um, transnational and comparative research and analysis, which is important given this region with its million languages um, and uh, historical um, turmoil in terms of political and social history as well. It also uh, offers uh, a great potential in terms of interdisciplinarity, and it's enough to think uh, about the history of the field itself and how intellectual history was created and the intersections of disciplines, um, which is nicely proven and shown by how the discipline or this kind of research is scattered around very, very different departments uh, in, different, um, in various national um, and institutional settings. Um, so, Although it is seemingly this ivory tower, tower within uh, the, uh, the, the, the discipline of history itself, it is uh, um, it has its um, its flexibility and openness that I find extremely useful. Um, I'm going to share a slide. I just put together a bunch of books. Um, for you to see and of course a moment ago with this worked and now it's not. So I'm just gonna um, I will just need a moment. My PowerPoint tends to freeze. Mm. And in this case I will continue without the PowerPoint for now. Um, and see if I can open it later. Uh, <laughs> So there has been um, uh, research already in the late 1980s uh, uh, about uh, uh, women <laughs> political specifically. Um, 
unfortunately, um, uh, and that's important. So, however, my PowerPoint started working. Let me just share it. Anyways, the, so the early development in, um, in focusing on women in political thought was reading through the canon um, and looking at how mostly men were writing about women, if at all. Um, and this came out from uh, uh, the appearance of feminist scholarship coming with what we know as the Western Second Wave in the 70s and 80s. Therefore, it was um, a very critical approach, which I think was nevertheless useful in terms of giving this critical read of the canon. Uh, although, according to this early work by authors such as Diana Kuhl, Susan Muller Okin, Ellen Saxonhaus, whatever man about women was never good enough and in one way or the other contributed uh, to the perseverance of women's oppression. What also came through from this research is, however, this interpretation and vision of what is politics and rethinking the concept of the political, of course, in light of uh, the feminist slogan from the 70s, the personal is political, which became a very fruitful methodological tool at the end of the day. And this is uh, also, um, this was also uh, made stronger through approaches from a history of concepts or back this Geschichte uh, at giving a feminist reading to this uh, part of the field. Um, in East Central Europe, uh, it, it's an interesting case. Like when you look at books about political thought in Europe, there is, usually no East Central European uh, name mentioned apart from look at uh, in the best case scenario. Um, and when women are, um, and I'm, I'm so much missing my slides, but my PowerPoint is not in its best shape and it's not showing. Uh, but when, um, when we think about East Central European women, women intellectuals, we know that they are out there. And uh, what happens to them, even in the feminist uh, attempts to create uh, readers or uh, historiographic narratives about women's political thought, they leave these women out um, and they become represented either as someone who is a generally good thinker, therefore doesn't need to be in a women's canon because she is just too good uh, for this to happen to her, such as Agnes Heller, or they appear uh, more as writers or public intellectuals, such as Dubravka Ugrasic or Slavanka Dracolic from former Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, the, the interpretation of their work as important contribution to feminist political thought or women's political thought um, is always uh, missing from the existing literature. It, it was um, actually um, an initiative uh, um, uh, from based at the Central European University, and Monica Barr, who was an important actor in this story, is sitting in the audience, uh, to start writing uh, the political thought, um, history of political thought in East Central Europe. Um, and this uh, first uh, was manifested in readers, and later um, uh, also in the uh, comprehensive work um, written by uh, Monica Barr, Balash Chenchenyi, and others. And now I can finally share my screen. So these are some of the books. Mm. These are some of the books that came out of this. Um, and what, So 
So what is uh, important that in the book themselves, a feminist thought was more and more um, increasingly integrated. Uh, similarly, though to what I mentioned about Ugrasic, Turkulic, and English Hala not being part uh, of um, traditional narratives about political thought in East Central Europe, um, there is also important research happening in other fields, and this ties us back to this issue of interdisciplinarity in uh, intellectual history, that a lot of research happens uh, about feminism and women's rights and women's movements, and late, lately uh, women's labor activism in Susan Zimmerman's uh, ERC project, where we have a lot of ideas produced by women in the region, discovered, interpreted, and presented. Uh, and um, obviously, my two fellow panelists have done important work in this field, um, as well as others, uh, even Anna Borgos's recent work on psych uh, women psychoanalysts in the interwar period shows how women in this part of the world were not uh, just um, latecomers in any kind of intellectual trend, but were producing uh, genuine original knowledge. It's also um, very interesting to me reading the field and the development in the recent years uh, to see uh, how uh, recent research, very, very recent research, uh, comes to the same authors from different directions. One of the things I have been working on recently um, has been um, a reader, and I'm going to sh try to show you. Um, about the history of feminism and women's rights in the region itself. Um, um, and uh, we came to an author, uh, Halina Krahelska from Interwar Poland, uh, whose work we thought should definitely be included in the book. And then recently it turned out that um, Jana Popova a scholar at the Central European University working in Susan's project came to uh, to a similar <clears throat> it came to the uh, realization how important she was and from the uh, perspective of women's labor history she was also writing about her. Uh, this all being said, um, what I would say to sum up is that a lot of uh, things need to happen in order to establish women's intellectual history from East Central Europe within the field of intellectual history and as a broader field of research. And this re involves a lot of methodological um, in in um, interventions, uh, such as to rethink what sources we can include and cannot include, and to take uh, publications and not even publications, but archival materials that have never been included into intellectual history before, such as women's magazines, letters, flyers, and even political speeches, speeches um, uh, to take the importance of silences very seriously and uh, do more of reading between the lines within the field. Uh, also, not to abandon the concept of originality, which is one of the most um, problematic and gendered, heavily gendered concepts here. Uh, but instead of abandoning the concept itself, let's reinterpret it and to integrate a biographical approach much more seriously in the field. So I will stop giving the word to the panelists. I'm sorry about this PowerPoint because it was really nice, but now it's not working. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. And um, a second, Susan. Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and Gabo Egri in particular for this wonderful conference idea. I think it's really one of the best conference ideas uh, uh, across which I have come in the past couple of years. So really to bring together statements about the state of the field and the most recent developments and also debates in the field. So in, in this short uh, initial statement, I will draw, as I was asked to, on insights gained from uh, 
my own more close research field, which is a large collaborative research project on the history of women's labor activism in Central and Eastern Europe and internationally from the, eight, from the end of the 90s to the end of the 20th century. This research has brought to light a wide spectrum of agendas, organizational forms, strategies, and scales of action in the large field of uh, women's labor activism. If we uh, take account of this historical variety and long-term transformation, we have come to make a case for developing and employing a uh, uh, an approach characterized, which can be labeled, which carries four labels. It should be long term, it should be transnational, a uh, transregional, sorry, transregional, integrative, and critical. And uh, in the following, I will focus on, on only on the, la the latter two, the integrative and the critical perspective. Conceptually speaking, an expansive and integrative approach is necessary to capture the full variety of women's labor struggles. This is first because women's labor struggles always involved class and gender issues simultaneously and often addressed other additional elements of social, social cultural difference and conflict. It is for this reason that we find historically and in the sources and everywhere, women's labor struggles in highly diverse and often historically strictly separated as well as competing social movement context, which we then in the, in the research need to think together. In order to do so, we need historical writing that does not prioritize class over gender or gender over class issues, but rather integrates the study of various social movements, con movement contexts, uh, contexts, sorry. That is rather than studying women in the labor movement or labor issues in the women's movement apart from each other. So we need to integrate what was historically often separated. Second, women labor struggles often involved gendered modes of action. To have a comprehend, and this uh, 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 reverberates very much with what Jofia just said in the field of intellectual history. So to have a comprehensive view of these modes of action, make them visible and interpret them, we need to overcome masculinist modes of defining the political and we need to expand the very concept of what constitutes activism in the first place. Research thus needs to focus not only on wage work, but also, for example, on unpaid work or another example, sexualized violence at the workplace. Research also needs to address a variety of spaces in which sometimes unexpected spaces in which women's activism took place, including, for example, neighborhoods rather than the factory, or self-run cooperative women's projects, or state-backed women's organizations. Turning to the need for a critical approach as building on the integrative one which I just pointed, let me highlight here one example, namely the debate on women's agency in the state socialist countries of Central and Eastern Europe and in the communist aligned international organizations that flourished during the period. In this debate, the work, those working within what, was, what has been labeled the feminist revisionist paradigm have pointed to the undeniable fact that anti-communism has played an important role in devaluing anything women did under state socialism. Indeed, some of the so scholarship inclined during the totalitarian, or to put it more blunt bluntly, the anti-communist model, has denied women the status of being historical agents in state socialist contexts unless they confronted and directly challenged the state socialist system. This anti-communist model, I would argue, in fact, 
reverberates with how mainstream historical scholarship treated women and their activism before women's and gender historians restored women to history. The, that, that model also suffers from biases similar to those hold in old school imperial and colonial histories, which have resulted in ignoring, marginalizing, and or devaluing the actions and perspectives of non-Western populations, deeming them irrelevant for the course of history. In return, however, so it looked like so far I'm aligned with the feminist revisionist paradigm, but I'm not, because in return, some of the feminist revisionist scholarship aimed at restoring agency to women living and acting in state socialist contexts has, not without reason, been characterized as celebratory. From the perspective of a critical history of women's labor activism, both the totalitarian and much of the feminist revisionist scholarship can indeed be characterized as lacking full historical contextualization and a fully reflective analysis of women's activism in these state socialist contexts and common communist aligned movement organizations more generally. The take of some of the feminist revisionist scholarship on women's action and agency under state socialism, in fact, has much in common with the classical recuperative women's history of the first generation and with scholarship also older scholarship which has glorified social movement history, for example, the history of the labor movement. And that speaks very much to real problem zones of this feminist revisionist scholarship. An integrated and critical approach that I advocate to the history of women's labor activism can help overcoming the impasse between the totalitarian and the revisionist schools of thinking about women's activist agency under state socialism. At the core of the integrative and critical approach lies a double move. While insisting on the historical relevance of women's activism in state socialist contexts, we should think in a conceptually and historically specific manner about these activisms while at the same time, and that's equally important, adopting a global perspective. In other words, we must conceive of this activism as an important dimension of an entangled global constellation of activisms and as integral to the global history of women's activism, all currents of which should be analyzed critically. This can be done, and this brings me to my last three points, this can be done by developing our an analysis with reference to three key sets of historical circumstances. First, we need to build our analysis on a clear delineation of the type of state or political system a specific type of women's labor activism developed in using a carefully developed global typology of political systems. Why is this relevant? For one thing, the state socialist system differed markedly from the idealized political constitution of the Western world. In state socialism, civic social movements were largely absent, while the state claimed to embody the interests of the working class, including the interests of working women. At the same time, despite its claim to represent women's quest for emancipation, the state socialist state was also deeply, a deeply masculine, masculinist one, and it sustained and reproduced masculinist traditions of the labor movement. It, this state also commanded limited material resources, many of which it reserved for economic catch-up policies within the global capitalist dominated economy. For another thing, when determining the structural conditions of women's power to act, it is important to consider 
the place that different types of states, including classical bourgeois, social democratic, colonial and state socialist, allotted to the vision and practice of emancipation for women belonging to lower social strata. The state socialist regime, the far-reaching qualifications and limitations I just mentioned, notwithstanding, was still relatively more open to and keen on considering working women's issues. This was an important factor that contributed to the willingness of women who identified with working women pro women's problems to closely engage with this state. The fact that the state socialist period can be regarded as, as, a, as the climax of the Eastern European state, which is a notion coined by Ulf Brunbauer and highly relevant for any study of women's labor activism in the region in the long-term perspective, something I uh, uh, deleted from my presentation for today. So the fact that the state socialist period can be regarded as a climax of the Eastern European state further undergirded the tendency for women activists to align in, in, in a variety of manners, uh, ways with this state. In the second half of the 20th century, women not only in Eastern Europe, but also in countries like Turkey or Austria regarded the expensive state as a privileged site through which to pursue their agendas of socio-economic improvement for women. We need thus to systematically consider these historically specific conditions of women's activism when developing a critical analysis of its character. Second, we need to explore more thoroughly the determining factors and political dynamics that shaped women's activism, or in my case, women's labor activism, within the expansive and layered state socialist political system. How exactly were women functionaries, women experts and professionals, women trade unionists at every level, from the shop floor to the highest reaches of government, and ordinary working women involved in formal and informal processes of decision making? Which rights did national women committees women's committees, factory-based shop stewards, and many other groups of activists, functionaries, and institutions involved with the politics of women's work acquire? And to what extent were they able to exercise these rights? And these are questions rarely asked, especially in, the, in both of the paradigms which I, have, uh, which, which I have mentioned, because the totalitarian paradigm says they had no agency, and the, uh, the revisionist paradigm celebrates their agency. And it's a nitty gritty thing to really compare how a Bulgarian trade union committee functioned uh, uh, and how a Hungarian one functioned, how this changed over time and things like that. Also the question of what material resources did these women's institutions command? And what was the scope of possibilities available to, to them when using these material resources? How did women aim to exploit the ever-shifting op opportunities to advance their agendas within the variable and changing policy frameworks afforded by the state socialist re regimes? And the last question, also very importantly, important, I believe, is how did these, these women themselves explain and react when they failed to achieve certain goals, which was a very regular occurrence, of course, if you look a bit critically at state socialism. In other words, we need to, to sum this up, this point number two here, we need to engage in a deep analysis of the formal and informal power relations in which women actors were involved and to which they contributed. And we need to establish the strategies they employed, the, ver the, vera the vari variations in their room of maneuver, uh, for, to maneuver their modes of activism and the eff effectiveness of their actions. Thirdly and lastly, 
we need to investigate and situate within a global framework the state socialist, the very state socialist, very model of women's emancipation, the related debates in which women during the state socialist period engaged, and the variegated policy te templates which were linked to the state socialist model of women's emancipation, of course, for which they advocated. Discussing West-East interactions, US American Dorothy, uh, historian Dorothy Sue Cobble has noted that labor feminists from both sides of the Iron Curtain entertained pretty similar women's labor rights agendas in substance and variety, all debate notwithstanding. Women labor functionaries and activists under state socialism regarded women's paid work as a liberatory force paid and paid close attention to women's involvement in and their attachment to care and reproductive work. And they went a long way to ease the tension between women's paid and unpaid labor. Although, and that also connected them across the Iron Curtain, they did so without fundamentally challenging the unequal relationship between both or crit with and without critically evaluating the letters, that is the unpaid works function in modern economic development. So their plans for a more women-friendly politics of women's work formed part of a long-term global trend of increasing women's involvement in paid employment and in the period in the global south in paid work as such. Rather than interrogating the overarching meanings and implications of this second half of the 20th century trend, many women engaged in the state socialist politics of women's work aimed to counterbalance its negative effects on large groups of working women. With the critical perspective advocated here, it is possible to move beyond the often celebratory emphasis on, in global comparison, the advanced agenda of the state socialist politics of women's work and contextualize it within this wider history of women's work in the 20th century as it played out on both sides of the Iron, Iron Curtain and in the Global South. This can contribute to the establishment of a more reflective view on the contributions as well as the limitations of women's labor, of the action of women's labor functionaries and activists within this larger context. In turn, approaching women's labor struggles in the state socialist context in such a manner can contribute to the advancement of more critical and integrative approaches to the history of women's labor struggles in other parts of and across the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and I would like to welcome everyone and it's a great honor to be here uh, today and thanks Gabor uh, for the invitation. Um, in the next few minutes, uh, while reflecting on my previous research experience, I'm going to talk about uh, a possible ERC project proposal that I have started planning over the last few months, which is going to be further developed over the next one or two years. Uh, therefore, I would greatly appreciate the comments uh, from Susan and Jofi, uh, who have uh, far more experience uh, than I do. And of course, I'm curious of the opinion uh, of the audience uh, as well. Uh, in my recently finished uh, research, I described, compared and analyzed three pre-World War I feminist associations uh, in the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. The two Budapest-based association, the Feministák Egyesülete Feminist Association and the Nőtisztviselők Országos Egyesülete National Association of Female Clerks, uh, and one Viennese association, Allgemeiner Österreichische Frauenverein General Austrian Women's Association, 
were established from, from an upper middle class milieu of educated professional women who had strong international connections and represented the radical wing of feminism in their societies. Another focus of this study was on the press history, uh, with which I emphasized the importance of publishing in the feminist activism of the time. In this research, I argued for a decidedly transnational perspective on women's and feminist movements and challenged the approaches that restricted uh, their analysis to a national framework. In contrast to earlier literature, I argued that to understand women's activism in Hungary, it is more relevant to compare women's activism with what took place in Austria and Germany uh, than to consider countries like the United Kingdom or the United States of America, which are both known as birthplaces of radical feminism. Thus, I suggested a more inclusive approach to the history of Austria-Hungary which has been split up into national historiographies after the collapse of the monarchy. This research contributed to Central European women's and gender history, and with the methodology of entangled history and with the comparative approach I employed, it outlined a perspective that has neither been sought in Austria nor Hungary. My approach not only contradicted Hungarian national perspectives, but also challenged widespread methodological nationalism in Austria that has resulted in a strong focus on German-speaking organizations in the Habsburg monarchy. Uh, on the one hand, I am perfectly aware of the fact that re this research on the three associations I've mentioned was far from being a comprehensive analysis of women's movements of the Habsburg monarchy. On the other hand, I believe that it could serve as a case study and as a model for a comprehensive analysis for examining women's activism in the region. Such an analysis cannot be reduced to what took place in the capital of Austria, and Hungary, or indeed in German and Hungarian-speaking context, as both halves of the, uh, of the monarchy were multicultural states, where women's movements were not only taking place, of course, in German and Hungarian-speaking contexts. Uh, the primary aim of my planned research project, project is to reconstruct uh, the history and the international network of contacts of Austrian, Hungarian, Slovak, Slo South Slavic, Czech and Moravian, Ruthenian, Transylvanian women's associations, as well as to study uh, the activism of their leaders. The Austro-Hungarian monarchy would be considered in this research as a transnational laboratory. Through this project, various national histories of women's movements uh, in the Central European region would be linked with each other. It has to be mentioned that in the majority of these territories, women's movement was connected with national awakening and liberation movements. The main goal would be to receive a more comprehensive picture of women's activism, women's associations, their relationship to one another and on their international embeddedness. Because of this, and because of the international networks of certain activists, it would be connected with, with research on the transnational women's movement and the suffrage movement. Furthermore, it would shed light on these issues from new angles. The starting point of the research would be the revolutionary year of 1848. I consider it very important to extend this study uh, to the period of state socialism as well. However, the main emphasis would be placed to the period between 1867 and 1945. In addition to the objectives outlined above, the following questions should be answered. Uh, how have women's organizations in different regions developed over the decades? What type of networks were formed uh, among them and how did they 
or did uh, they not intensify? How did international women's organization, uh, organizations influence this process? And why is it a factor of key importance in this process that certain women's movement activists could afford to travel? On the other hand, an uh, important question is, how did the activism of those women formulate it who couldn't travel? It is also important to examine how women's associations, the territories inhabited by ethnic minorities related to Austrian and Hungarian associations. Among the few works which had been published related to certain aspects of this subject matter, I would like to mention uh, at this point the papers of Susan Zimmerman, Natasha Vittorelli, uh, Gabriela Dudakova, Martina Moravec, as well as the edited uh, volumes of Edith Kirai, Waltraud Heindler and Alexandra Mielner. Um, and besides these, the biographical dictionary on 19th and 20th century women's movement activists has to be highlighted, which was edited by Francisca de Han, Krasimira Daskalova, and Anna Lutfi. Uh, the systematic analysis of the development, the main aims, and the international network of contacts of these regions, women's associations, as well as the study of the activism of their leaders would be necessary because of two reasons. Firstly, because of this, we would be able to receive a comprehensive picture of the different profiles of women's association in the multi-ethnic Austro-Hungarian Empire and in its successor states, as well as on the characteristic features and dynamics of the contexts among them. These networks of contacts can also be interpreted uh, as mobility channels, such as it can be detected, detected in the case of the Hungarian feminist activist Rozsika Schwimmer. Of course, this project idea still needs to be refined in many respects, uh, regarding, for example, the methodology, the source base, and most importantly, colleagues need to be involved from other countries. It is also a big question for me how the topic could or should be narrowed down because a systematic analysis of so many associations in one single project is impossible, of course. It also has to be considered whether multicultural effects can be examined systematically in this research. Uh, but with this project, however, I would like to facilitate accordance uh, with several other scholars, the decentralization of the scholarship on the history of women's movement and women's activism further. Uh, and I would also urge uh, the more intensive inclusion of Central European regions uh, in the research of women's associations uh, and the network of, con uh, of contacts between them. Uh, while there is no doubt uh, that uh, progress has been made in this area during the last almost uh, two or three decades, researchers of the region still have a lot of work to do to make women's movement's history of the region more, region more visible. This, however, requires not only research level, uh, research results and a high level of knowledge uh, of one, two, or sometimes more languages from the researchers, a significant amount of funding and the support of uh, foreign publishers. But I think that it's another question that we will discuss later. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, uh, my first question, um, maybe um, it's a little different focus uh, on our topics, and it uh, concerns uh, the re relationship uh, between gender history and uh, the traditional, mainly uh, male-focused uh, national narratives. And um, maybe I think it 
that will be the, my last question <laughs> before I uh, open up space for the audience. So, uh, what do you think uh, would be a good uh, program, uh, desired aim, uh, to give a great greater role to women uh, to women's stories um, to the achievements of gender historiography uh, in national narratives or on the contrary uh, should gender history be an alternative to a uh, challenger to uh, to traditional nat national narratives linked to the other new types approaches like global history, transnational history, etc. Susan? Can you collect a couple of questions? Okay. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, okay. It's uh, for the, the I please welcome Okay. Thank you. Just a moment for the microphone. So, thank you all for um, your presentations. Um, I uh, have a question to this uh, very interesting um, proposal, or which is um, in, um, this is um, um, a project uh, in work. Mm, I would like uh, to know whether it would be an interesting uh, point uh, to connect this uh, feminist um, organizations uh, with the trade unions, um, because um, I guess that, um, at least uh, one of the main uh, problems of the uh, feminist uh, movement uh, was uh, paid labor. The, so, uh, final issue uh, adequate uh, compensation uh, for uh, women's uh, work. And um, it might be interesting to see um, in, to what extent uh, the uh, feminist organizations um, succeeded in um, um, integrating uh, their uh, wishes into the, um, into the trade unions. Um, agenda uh, when uh, they were uh, negotiating with um, um, business uh, organizations or uh, with uh, the state about, um, uh, for example, uh, compulsory uh, welfare and um, other um, um, security uh, issues uh, at the uh, at the workplace, so it is not only the financial uh, compensation, uh, but uh, also um, uh, workplace security and pension uh, and so on. Um, and um, uh, therefore, the agenda of the trade unions and um, uh, business uh, professional organizations uh, can potentially be an, an interesting uh, avenue when um, uh, analyzing the feminist movements. Don't know. It's just a proposition. Uh, thank you. Uh, third question. Yeah. Please. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful panel. Um, I was. I have two. One common slash question first, and another uh, common perhaps. Um, for the first one relates to my own conundrum. I mean, women's studies, I'm not a historian, but my own conundrum relating to the concept of transnationalism, which is trending everywhere, right? We all want to do transnational research, all of us, interdisciplinary, transnational, in every field, every discipline. I go, was going, going to go back to Dora's wonderful, Dora's wonderful project, and I might just, my comment, my question in my own, my own mind, is whether you mention it's a transnational or international network that you are looking at. But at the end of the day, isn't it would it be more productive to use a transregional concept a little bit more? No, thank you for that reaction. 
Because after all, you are falling back upon the Austro-Hungarian laboratory. And when it comes to the transnational and the global, right, you want to stretch it. But as you said, it's, it's much more relevant to compare this, this nations within the region than perhaps with the United States of America or an African country. So I'm going back to the idea of the usefulness of limiting the transnational to the transregional in your case. My other question slash comment is a little bit more explosive. I hope it is because that's the feminist project at the end of the day, right? To um, ask difficult questions. Um, you mentioned, Susan, right? Um, the idea of making it inter, uh, inter integra integral and critical. I'm coming from the the U.S. side of women's studies, so we talk about inter, um, intersectionality a lot. And you also mentioned that it's important to make some factors of this intersectional unit that gender connects with more salient based upon the context, the historical context, always contextualized, as my graduate advisor used to say. So you uh, mentioned social class, its salience, and considering other factors also. But coming from the US where what is really salient at this point in time is race, obviously, and queer identity. I was just wondering, is, a, is there a space for queerness in Central East, Central Europe studies? Not yet. Is it happening in terms of labor studies? Your thoughts on this? Thank you so much. Let me take the trade union question first, which is really at the core of the interest in our project. To give you a schematic answer to this is, uh, uh, you have historically, you have women's organizations in which the interests of lower class women are marginalized. So they are very often middle class dominated. This, it's schematic, of course, in, the, in reality you have much more variety. But I think the schematic approach still captures an essential dimension. So you have these, then you have the labor movement and its trade unions and organizations which are absolute masculinist in outlook, not only in terms of membership and hierarchy, but also in terms of agenda. So the agendas, or the agendas or issues of working women are marginalized there. And then you have, and Dora has looked at some of these, uh, you have uh, women only organizations of working women, right? You have women clerks and you have also uh, women trade unionist type organizations, you have them uh, on, on a local level, but you have them in 1919 for the first time also internationally. Uh, what's the problem there? They are small, they are isolated, and they lack resources. I mean, all uh, social movements lack resources and so, but if you get down to organizing labor, uh, uh, working with or specific groups of working women on their own, it becomes more complicated. Um, and uh, what we try to do in our project is to really conceptually not prioritize one of these possibilities or marginalizations over the other, but just to understand and, uh, and uh, analyze why women choose which of these three problematic opportunities or possibilities in a given setting and what the consequences were. So this is, this is our base approach. Uh, about the integrative and the intersectional, I, I, I mean, I use intersectional methods and uh, I do certain steps in the analysis using an intersectional approach or method. But I think the, uh, not I think, but by definition, the concept of the integrative approach is much broader than that. 
I tried to give very, very abbreviated examples of that. So if you look at women's labor activism, you need to look at what they do around care work, about family, about the community. They often play roles, which has been called by a colleague in strikes, for example, they do reproductive strike work. So that's not my term. So they really support strikers building on very traditional uh, divisions of labor and uh, imagine and visions of what a woman should do and what she would not do and the integrative and this is only two examples now so the integrative uh, perspective does include intersectional uh, approaches uh, but certainly is not uh, restricted to it the the the, the transregional was of course uh, and transnational you you just supported my argument, which I, into which I didn't go in the presentation so much, except at the one point where, as an example, when I, when I had this example about the women's agency under state socialism debate, right, I brought in, and that's part of our project, Austria and Turkey, it's both cooperative with states in the post-1945 period, so they differ from some state socialist states, but you can also, if you just integrate them conceptually in your research, you can also find a lot of similarities or parallels, and that uh, helps really to develop a, 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 I think, a more reflective and less container type of view on, on what was going on under state socialism. I could go on about queerness and so, but I leave the word to my co-panelists. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the questions and firstly I would like to react to this concept of uh, transnational or transregional and I'm sorry for shaking my head. Uh, in this uh, really short presentation I didn't have time uh, to discuss uh, the importance of the international women's associations uh, in this project. Uh, several uh, associations were formed uh, from the 1880s, 1890s, uh, to which uh, women's associations uh, of these uh, regions uh, joined uh, at the beginning uh, of the 20th century. And of course, there's a difference uh, between the intensity of the uh, contact and the, um, the characteristic features of the network of contacts, because uh, of course, I that uh, with the Austrian and the Hungarian case, it was very, very intensive. Uh, but uh, for example, uh, it was similar in case of the Czech uh, women. Uh, but uh, if we talk about, uh, for example, the Slovakian uh, women, uh, it was not so intensive. Uh, so there were differences. But I Thing that it's very, very important uh, to discuss here the transnational level of the organization because uh, these three layers, the local associations, the national associations and the international associations uh, go uh, very strictly uh, to each other and the contacts, uh, the contacts, uh, the discussion of these contact, uh, contacts is relevant. Um, and uh, to the other question related uh, of Maria related to the um, uh, to the connection between the feminist organization and the trade uh, unions. Uh, of course, uh, this research has to be uh, refined and um, and many times reformulated, I think. Uh, but uh, I I believe that there is a strong link and trade union uh, unionism will appear in the research, but there won't be uh, a very large emphasis uh, on this. I would like uh, to place the emphasis of the net on the network of contacts. Thank you. Okay. I would Um, Susan and Dora were uh, more addressed than I was. Um, but thinking about the transnational and the transregional 
um, issues, I, I would actually um, join Doda in my answer when it comes to intellectual history. And I also wonder when we talk about the region, as much as I find it important that we talk about East Central Europe as a region and we think about it in a comprehensive framework, I think that when we talk about exchanges within the region, that's more an intra-regional one. Uh, um, and at the same time, when it comes to political ideas, this region cannot be isolated from a broader framework. So we necessarily need to think in terms of a transnational story. Uh, although uh, what I'm trying to do with my project um, is to show that uh, transnational is not um, a west to east direct transfer in one direction, but it's much more complex and complicated. And I very much um, enjoyed Susan's uh, talk when uh, when she talked about uh, state socialism um, and um, women's rights and how we need new research to reassess what happened in this part of the world. Um, and to to find a more contextually based, um, to do more contextually grounded research, many um, both in uh, labor history but also in intellectual history, because what is very important here uh, when we when we look at this period is that we have a, a socialist uh, experiment uh, uh, to give women. Um, a certain set of rights that in most countries in this part of the world they didn't have before. And there are, of course, exceptions, uh, but in many cases, this was new, this level of industrialization, alphabetization of women. And, um, and their reflection on this is something very special. And when I, when I look at um, uh, Marxist and socialist feminist thought, uh, in Western Europe, you don't find the kind of reflection and the kind of understanding of um, uh, women's lived reality the way you find in um, in local in the work of local authors and there are thinkers such as Blazenka Despot from former Yugoslavia, whose uh, whose feminist socialist uh, suggestions and whose reading of Marx is quite uh, exemplary and. Um, we need to be integrated into broader narratives. Uh, this makes me also uh, come back to uh, to Kadoi's uh, very big and very, of course, difficult question about the national context. Uh, and I'm probably not the right person uh, to talk about national historiographies in the sense that I'm a little bit outside of every system. I'm, um, I started out as a Yugoslavist, but I'm Hungarian, but I was never trained in Hungary as a historian. Uh, but what we would, I think, need is that uh, mainstream national um, historiographies integrate a gendered perspective much more broadly. And this is something that we have been preaching for, for a very long time. And there are very good developments in this regard. Uh, but probably more dialogue would be helpful. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's of course, an especially difficult case with intellectual history because of the way it's, um, as I mentioned, scattered between uh, disciplines and departments. Thank you. Thanks. Any other remarks? No? So next round of question. Uh, I think, uh, no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One of the, uh, first, I want to thank you very much and I was very happy to hear Rosika Schimmel-Lloyd's name because I wrote about her Twitter like 40 years ago. <laughs> So the Columbia papers are incredible. That's it's a fantastic collection and can be. I suppose you work there. Actually, I know this collection because I researched there for several months. So. Yeah. So just to tell you, it's an emotional. <laughs> it's it's fascinating. It's really incredible. And immense. <laughs> so 
that that's just a side point. <laughs> um, uh, one of the questions I was asking myself, listening to you uh, all, was the uh, strange relationship between uh, the way gender is used here and the fact that we are in fact talking about feminism. Uh, and it goes beyond the, um, the intersectional idea that we heard about before. Um, so I think that one of the points that we are confronted with, and this was mentioned by our first speaker, is the crisis in demography in the region. And part of this crisis is connected uh, to men, at least as much as to women. And what is it to be a man in Central Europe? And uh, I find it important to mention that this set of questions has to be assessed in a way or in another. And it's not absolutely, of course, different from what we're talking about, but that's part of it. And the second thing is, uh, Susan mentioned um, state socialism and uh, the way there were common features, but one of the not common feature was the relationship to abortion and it's changed very many times and the way women bodies were handled by the system and uh, having been here in Hungary and lived very little in Romania in the 80s the differences were really striking and goes also the same mention could be made about the way homosexuality was handled by the various social systems with very many differences so maybe the gender issue can also be relevant to think the uh, coherences or incoherences on this regional level. That was one question. Thank you. Uh, Lucia? No. Thank you very much, everyone, for the great uh, presentations. I just had some thoughts which were kind of prompted by uh, Dora's uh, presentation, but then I realized actually they could be well integrated into the other two. So, um, it's a great, I think, presentation and the idea. What came to my mind is that, um, and maybe you are dealing with it otherwise, and it was just not here in the presentation, uh, was associational culture in a way that, so you kind of describe this, you know, uh, typical liberal associations at the turn of century, Austria-Hungary, and so on. Perhaps maybe from Susan's presentation, this could be a masculinist way of organizing, or I don't know, I'm asking it rather as a question, but then we progressed uh, to talk about also this kind of profession or work-related women's organizations and so on. And do you think uh, this kind of change in the morphology of how they are organizing could be also used as kind of um, source for political thought as well. So, and yes, if, if this is a prominent thing in your project, and if not, maybe it would be a good point to say that, you know, um, yeah, they are experimenting with different things, they are changing strategies, they are marginalized by different movements they maybe initially hope to get emancipation from, but they then don't <laughs> end up getting it, and so on and so forth. And if this could be somehow these practices and associational morphologies could be useful. This could also help with the visibility because usually when we think about civil societies and associational cultures in the region, we always think about men, women, you know, movements and associations. So this could also be kind of a nice women's history of civil society in that way. That's, um, but that's, that's a kind of a basic story. And just last thing is about, you said that uh, this transnationalism and so on. Um, I wouldn't 
be so, how to say, um, straightforward about it was more developed in this linguistic context and less developed in this, because this is the time when people choose their nationality. So maybe a woman who was, you know, born uh, in Hungarian speaking context in the Slovak majority, whatever, and then maybe she said that, oh, it makes more sense for me to organize with the Hungarian speaking women, although I'm bilingual or trilingual, I could make a choice, but politically for me, you know, I will move to Budapest and uh, join, the, join the association there. So what I'm saying is that I don't think it should be very nationally um, kind of, because that's not the point at the turn of century. You could easily say that, not just li even linguistic contexts um, in my mind are a bit less relevant. So, so yeah, just to, not, to, not to have an ERC where there is somebody researching Slovak feminist associations or Croat or whichever, Hungarian, because that's such an ambiguous and choice-based thing that, it, uh, in my opinion, doesn't make, um, doesn't give value to the research. Uh, thanks. And uh, last, yes, take the all. Yeah, okay. Uh, the servant, but uh, I ask uh, a short question <laughs> and or remarks. Okay, I make a short question and remark. <laughs> uh, I'm curious since the conference is about new uh, concepts in historiography, so it's uh, my question would be, um, uh, where is the rural world um, in new gender history? Um, is there the rural world at all? Um, and I'm just, uh, I mean, there's, I'm still thinking about, there's a book which has been extremely praised, but also sold in, in, um, in, in, in broad numbers uh, of a German historian. Uh, it, the, maybe you know the book, it's about a Hof und elf Geschwister, a farmstead and eleven siblings and he's interviewing his brothers and sisters about their role in rural life and family and the, the female male roles generational changes and so on and uh so since i was asked to be short <laughs> the question is um i mean how much is the, ru the rural um world taking serious rural agencies uh, in the focus of, of a new gender history should it be more uh, maybe you can all, all three uh, i don't know who wants to uh, comment on uh, hi just real quick uh, to to both of you actually all the three of you so uh back to the previous panel and the discussion on the iron curtain whether it's relevant or not uh, i would like to ask all of you but especially susan you mentioned examples from turkey austria but also from eastern europe um, you also um, mentioned the totalitarian versus the revisionist paradigm which come with their particular views on the relevance of the iron curtain um, is it still relevant today um, in your um, gender histories and to what extent. Uh, from Susan's presentation, I, I, my hypothesis is that, is that your answer is yes and no, but probably some more nuance would be would be helpful in terms of the broader discussion of what to do with the Iron Curtain metaphorically and you know, as a real uh, thing. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, uh, 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 thank you very much to, to all three presentations. Um, I want to direct one question to, to Susan Zimmermann. Um, I'm very sympathetic to your approach. And actually the word I, I think I like most was the rather innocuous word, nitty gritty. So you said historical research is nitty gritty. And that's another way of saying that it, it eschews sort of these grand interpretative schemes and the truth is very often somewhere in the middle. And I think one of the things that I'm, I, I, I kind of w would like to add from an economic history perspective here is that when we speak about the development of women's rights to, to work in the 1950s and 60s, there, there obviously also is the actual economic need for them to work. So this is both the right and effectively the duty to work. So, um, the state socialist economies, they, they, they move radically from rural to urban. They 
uh, and in this process, when you look at household budgets, basically both in a couple need to work to make ends meet. So on some level, the, the, the pro-work ideology catches up with the actual economic necessity to work for both men and women in these families. And uh, so I think what I would like to know from you, because you seem to have sort of this idea of um, re-revisionist idea in mind, how would you describe the position of a working woman in Hungary in the 1950s and 60s compared to, let's say, Austria? I mean, there's a lot. I can't go into all of this, of course, because we will be running out of time. Two things are really important for me. And maybe Jofia would like to qualify the following statement, but maybe not. So as it happens, the three of us do something like activism, right? in a very broad sense, right? You do more the classical activi women's activism, but from a new perspective, I focus on labor activism and Jovia focuses on the intellectual side of it, right? In, in a sense, right? So this is how the panel should have been called. Uh, it's a, it's, there is a focus in new gender histories on these varieties of activism, but it's coincidental that the three of us do that. There are people who do changing gender visions during the First World War. There are many people who do completely different things that in gender history of Central and Eastern Europe that have nothing to do at all with activists, with the history of activism. That brings me to your point about the rural, and the good news is it's coming. <laughs> Uh, you have uh, exceptional works already since a long time. For, for example, Ildiko Astalos Morel's work about women in the, in, in the agricultural sphere under state socialism and in post-state socialism. But you have now really many more people who have started to do work about women and gender in the, rural, in the rural sphere. So it's a super relevant topic and it is an under-researched topic, but not for long. <laughs> um, the, and the last thing to which I would react, because that's where I come from, uh, and this is, I have coined the term, I think some 20 years ago, that uh, the state socialist uh, average family was a dual, dual worker one income family right and uh, i would not say it was this way or that way but uh, in state socialist early politics which were driven by productivism and catch-up uh, interests it was a very it was a deliberate policy to get wages down to a level that everybody has to work that you need a dual income family and it fitted well with the socialist model of emancipation. I mean, not the low wages, but emancipation of women through paid work. I mean, we could do much more about it, but I did not want to say it's an ideology and then they make women work, right? Or the other way around, it's, it's, it's a good fit, right? And it's also a specific fit because you could have a dual income family which would not do it simply because they have to. It could be also a family which wants more wealth or, or uh, a, a higher middle class status. And that, of course, was not the case under, under state socialism. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the questions and uh, comments. Uh, maybe firstly, I would like to uh, react to the question related uh, to um, rural uh, world uh, and gender history disconnection uh, related to uh, the history of associations and activism. Um, it is uh, strange because uh, when I first started to um, focus uh, on the Hungarian uh, associations. 
uh, I found lots of letters uh, from uh, activists uh, from small towns and villages uh, which were uh, addressed uh, to the leaders uh, of the associations, the feminist associations, Rosika Schwimmer, for example. Uh, and firstly, uh, these letters didn't seem to be interesting, but uh, now we have an excellent project uh, for the examination of these letters uh, at the University of Vienna. So uh, this uh, aspect uh, of this uh, question uh, will be dealt uh, in greater depth uh, very, very soon. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there are uh, a few associations uh, from the rural world uh, for example, the Boa Mazuivaros um, Women's Association, which is uh, very well known in Hungary um, as well, because uh, these women were closely connected to the feminist association. Uh, and I think uh, that it, it was very, very important because it uh, opened a new angle, a new aspect uh, of the organization uh, structure. Uh, and thanks uh, for the comments uh, as well. And yes, these are the things uh, which has to be um, refined, uh, but um, I just wanted to uh, tell you a quick example uh, from the Transylvanian women, because uh, here we have Hungarian-speaking women and German-speaking women, and I have a list from those activists uh, who uh, belong to three different uh, organizations, German-speaking, Hungarian-speaking, uh, maybe uh, Romanian uh, women uh, as well, and they, they had uh, contacts uh, with each other. Sometimes they hated each other, but there were uh, events when they uh, cooperated. Okay. Jofi? Thank you, Susan, for uh, connecting our work in terms of working on activism. I think it's it's, um, it's a very valid point. Um, I would just a uh, quick reflect uh, on Lucia's um, very nice comment about associational culture, because I think that <clears throat> uh, focusing on sociability and interpersonal relations is um, extremely helpful for whatever kind okay. of research we do. Uh, I think so much about what, uh, uh, how certain outcomes happen, and it helps us overcome, or it, it, it can very nicely run parallel with acknowledging that there is contingency in history, but there were also those so far um, unacknowledged or under-researched aspects that come from the interpersonal, the intimate, and the... <clears throat> um uh, and the private sphere uh i also thought to come back to this uh, question whether the iron how much the iron curtain is relevant and how much it is not and just to say that i think this very question takes us back to the issue how we talk about this region what belongs to our region and what is the place of hungary and east central europe and eastern europe in a broader frame framework um and obviously to say that ever since uh, state socialism happened and the Iron Curtain happened, we cannot not talk about it because it still defines um, um, not just our history, but also our present. But I would also maybe stop here. I don't know if there are more questions or are we saying goodbye? <laughs> no, I think no other question so uh uh and i i, I think our time is running out maybe so uh thanks uh um for your attention and uh, uh the uh active participation uh, of the audience and uh, i would like to uh thanks uh especially uh all the panelists uh to susan to dora and to uh Jofi, uh for your participation and for this uh inter interesting discussion 
So uh, the next program point is uh, lunch break. So maybe it's a uh, um, good time for another informal discussion. Livia. Um, Thank you so much uh, to the audience and for their attention, but also to my co-panelists for their amazing presentations and to Karoy for the great uh, moderation and introduction of the panel and uh, very much to Gabor again for bringing us together um, and to Livia for all her assistance, including my all of, uh, a sudden disappearance and reappearance online. So thank you, and I'll be following um, the conference from my computer, but enjoy, and uh, all the best to everybody.